of what we are and for the next generation. The other brilliant thing is I'm convinced it, will, it can work, and it can work like a lot of campaigns can. I think we've got an awful lot going for us. So, why do you need a campaign? Um, basically what I'm saying here is not going to happen by accident. It's not going to happen um, by individuals taking action. It's got to be coherent, there has to be some sort of a plan. You need strategic, substance-driven communications. You need milestones along the path. Um, you need to, to really focus on a number of small messages. You can't talk about everything. If someone puts a microphone in your face, you'll only be able to say three things, and I guarantee you the audience will only remember two of them. You'll want to talk about your life in the arts. It's, it, it's not going to happen. You need a menu of tools, strategies, very, very sophisticated campaign. You need a living campaign, a campaign that's flexible, that changes as the climate changes. And you need resources. So how the hell are we going to do that if we don't get together, unite, pool resources, pool our capacity? So here it is, the campaign toolbox. I'm giving this to you free. I'm the Harvey Norman of cultural communication. <laughs> First one, very obvious. And you're like, what's wrong with that? I'm going back to it. We need to unite, we need to get strategic, we need to plan. I use this phrase with a lot of network groups, uh, which is one beacon, many fires. Um, network groups can be great, but they can be a disaster as well, because everyone comes to the table with the monkey of their own organization on their back. For this one, you've got to leave it outside the room. This is about the pie, not your slice of the pie. You've got to leave that all behind you. It's got to be action focused, it's got to be outcomes focused. It's not a talking shop, it's about doing things. Um, and it's also about whoever ends up leading this, it's about letting them lead. Let them make the mistakes, they'll learn, they'll be on Morning Iron, they'll put their foot in it. Don't carry them, support them and say you got it wrong, but you'll get it right the next time. And please, please, if there is a campaign that comes out of this, and I'm making a huge assumption here, no one, no one has mentioned this by the way, um, please get a flexible, simple structure. Do not get a complex, um, bureaucratically driven one. You need to set key objective objectives. Not your objectives, but looking at it coldly. To be ambitious but realistic. So be ambitious enough to make a difference, but re realistic enough that you know you can get success. And also short and long term focus. So, this is off the top of my head. I have no idea whether this would be in or not without doing a proper briefing. But you can imagine these might be good objectives for a campaign that's going to make the case for the arts. So that you get the arts onto the news, social affairs, business pages and programmes. The arts is going to be on the arts pages anyway. You don't need to worry about that. So how do you get it into the everyday life of the nation? You, you need to ensure a critical mass of influential public is convinced of this. And here we're not talking about the general public, you're talking about very targeted uh, groups. Um, you'll be looking at sectors, uh, the media, tourism, chambers of commerce, maybe even health, you know, the arts and health, the arts and education. You want to get the arts back on the agenda, but not just any agenda, you want to get it back on your agenda, the one that you're setting. And you, you also want to, to influence the, the, the arm of the people who are at the table. You want to strengthen the arm of the Arts Council, you want to strengthen the civil servants who are probably silent, but basically on your side. And there are probably a couple of ministers who are very sympathetic, but we're just not hearing them. And what you're doing is being really bright, really clever. You're segmenting them, you're prioritizing them, and you're talking to them in different ways, using different messages. It's, not, it's everyone you need, not everybody you want. The better use of scare resources, you know, on any campaign, you could break it out you know, into threes. It may not be a third, but it's often in threes. There's the, the, the third who will never agree with you. There's the third in the middle, and there's the third who are on your side. And through, through the generations, activist groups have been talking to themselves, the people who support them, and wasting their resources and time on it when they're already on the side, or else trying to score points from the people who will never agree with them. Forget about them. They're not going to agree with you. The really interesting people are the ones in the middle, ordinary decent folk who are trying to make up their minds. 
You know, what's important about the arts? How does it affect my life? They're the people you would usually talk to in a very creative and a, and a very sensitive way. You also need to understand them where they're at, talk where they're at, not where you're at, and you need to respect them. Huge amount of complexity going on in, in those few words. Uh, I won't go into it because I don't have time. Research. In activist groups, in the voluntary sector, in arts groups, it's full of anecdote, hearsay, I believe this. How do you know unless you do the research? You need the knowledge. If you're trying to move people from A to B in terms of attitude and opinion, you, you need to know where A is first. Um, you need to understand the climate for communications, you need to research that. Good feeling isn't evidence. It's also a more effective use of resources, obviously. Um, I won't go into this, but the last piece of research was the Arts Council in 2006. Mary will probably tell us more about that. But basically, a very warm view among the general public. The case has, has been made, people were on side. Even to the question, should arts be supported in their session, people say yes. And just in preparation for this, we went out in the streets, we talked to 88 people, this is not scientific obviously at all, we talked to them in Dublin inner city and in Bray. And basically, things were quite similar, except it had eroded a bit. So we asked one question, for instance, if it was a choice between arts and sport, which would you go for? And it was like 90% said sport, it was tangible, they could understand it. They also looked at arts in terms of their kids rather than themselves. And already in that, and in that, in that Arts Council report, there's great um, insight in terms of where we should be placing our messages, where people are. Sorry, there, just at the end, there was research partners. You know, you can, there's loads of research there. It doesn't cost a fortune all the time. There's research out there as a matter of pulling it, pulling it together. We were involved in a campaign with uh, Dolphin House uh, flat complex in Dublin, where they were polling people and what they wanted out of regeneration. We got UCD, research department, involved in it. They did it for free, and it was a really complex, sophisticated piece of research. You can get partners in on it. Messages. You need to make great messages. I call them intimate dramas that move hearts and minds. So if you don't set your agenda, you'll end up reacting to somebody else. If someone says to you, I don't know, um, the money we're spending in art should be spent on hospital beds. If you've already gone in and talked about the need for arts in terms of um, country's well-being, you've already won the argument. If the, the tone, the voice you use, it's not a time for whining anymore. You know, it's not, what do we want, utopia, when do we want it now? It has to be coherent, intelligent, responsible, trustworthy. Plus it has to be consistent, and that goes back to those three, four, five things you're going to be saying, and it's all within that framework, and you're leaving certain stuff out. No jargon. Um, seductive proposition of radical reason, but that's just me being clever. <laughs> So, messages, what kind of messages? Very fucking few. <laughs> it's all about what you're not saying, as much about what you're not saying as what you're saying. Um, and you're saying different things to different people. And you're, you're talking to where the audience is at. Okay, here's seven possible message themes that you might go with. Again, I've no idea whether these would be right or not. And you, this is just the theme rather than the actual message. You'd find much more accessible language for it. But the arts and Irishness. Right, you'd find some new language around that. I think there's something really important there. The thing of defining the arts for people. People think about the arts, maybe visual arts, my kid in school, but they don't think of the breadth. It's the, they often don't include film, architecture, the cultural industry of Ireland. Um, they're the soft bits, the one, two, three. The rest of them are the harder bits. I think people would be really surprised at the amount of livelihoods that are made out of the arts, the solid jobs in the economy. The economic uh, contribution and cultural tourism, and I know a lot of people go, oh no, not that again, but they, now, at this moment in time, it's, it's hugely compelling. The last piece of research done on the value of the arts, I think, was in 94, Temple Bar Properties did it. And that, 